the fourth chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We read this evening at verse 1, we're going to read down to verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. The Word of God says this, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's Word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Let's go to our God together in prayer. Lord, now we pray for your gracious assistance as we preach. Lord, please be at work in me, watching over this time in such a way, Lord, that I would say nothing that would grieve your spirit, nothing that wouldn't be good for your people. Please be at work in my own heart so that, Lord, this act of preaching would be an act of worship and be at work in our hearts as we listen that we would listen tonight as worshipers that we would all listen submissively ready to hear ready to receive ready to submit to that which is true and right wherever your word speaks Lord may you work in this next hour to magnify your Son, to enlighten our minds and hearts with the truth, that we might walk with Him in a way that is pleasing to you. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe in Christianity as I believe that the Son has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. I think it's, it's the last part of that statement by C.S. Lewis that may be the most profound. Listen to it again. I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. That's what we should all be able to say, that I see everything else by the light of Christ. I see everything else by the light of Christian truth. That's what we should be able to say, but is that what we can really say tonight? That we're seeing everything else in our lives, everything else in our world by the light of Christ, by the light of God's Word? That's the goal of this conference this weekend that we would see this issue that we've come together to discuss, we would see it by the light of Christian truth. We live in a chaotic world, I don't have to tell you that. We see the chaos all around us all the time. It's on our television sets as the news tells us what's going on in this city or that city, this march, that march. It's, It's a chaotic world. We know it not just in that sort of way, we know it many times in a very personal way. Why is it a chaotic world? Because it's a world full of sinners. The chaos is explained by sin. And sin's chaos is manifested in every realm of life. Man knows a personal chaos because of sin. When you think about some of the things that we 
again, come in contact with in our world, you know, gender confusion, homosexuality, personal sinning on all sorts of levels. What is this? This is sin's confusion in man's own person. We know confusion and chaos in our closest relationships. This world is full of broken homes and broken lives. We know sin's confusion in our societies and communities. We live in a world at war with itself. And if we ask why is there a war in this world, the answer is because it's an idolatrous world. When men do not find their hearts satisfied by God, their hearts will not be satisfied. James 4 addresses that, right? What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. Right? We're not looking to the Lord for the satisfaction of our hearts. And even sometimes when we do ask, we ask wrongly. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. This is the chaos that sin produces in a life that has self at the center, pride on the throne, selfishness at the core. All of this chaos is manifesting death. With sin has come death. Sin made its entrance into the world and death came as a result. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die, the Lord said. They ate of it and they did die. God told the truth. Now every person born into the world is born spiritually dead. That state of spiritual death is a state of spiritual darkness. Sin, death, darkness. Darkness of mind, darkness in the heart. This is what the chaos manifests, the, the darkness and the death of sin. And so we recognize that we live in a world full of people who are full of evil desires. Evil desires emerging from evil hearts. Haters of God, haters of men. As the book of Jeremiah describes hearts, hearts that are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Why is our world at war with itself? Because the natural man, the unregenerate man, knows nothing of the love of God. Incapable of loving God, therefore incapable of really loving people. And this is where we all once were. Those of us who know Christ. Titus 3.3 says, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. That's a real picture, isn't it? That's the world we live in. That's the world of lost humanity. You see, what we've got to recognize is what we're dealing with in this world is not some superficial wound. In fact, I want us to establish this at the outset, what we're talking about this weekend, that there is no political fix for what ails this world. There's no human solution for the problem. There's no cultural analysis or commentary or social program that can fix what's wrong. There's only one answer for such a world. There's only one hope in the midst of the chaos, and His name is Jesus. And the only way that this world will ever hear about Jesus and come to a saving knowledge of Christ and be able to walk in the newness of life that is found in Jesus Christ, the only way is if we preach the Word of God. You see, when the light of the gospel confronts the darkness, when the clarity of the gospel cuts through all the confusing voices that we hear in this world, and the sovereign Spirit of God unshackles a soul, when God says, let there be light, 
and the light of God shines into the darkened soul of man so that Christ is seen on the pages of Scripture in all of his beauty, and he is loved, and he is believed in and embraced for life. Now what happens is that there's a new creation. All things pass away. All things become new. Through that saving work, peace replaces chaos. Love replaces warring. Compassion replaces pride. God brings order out of disorder. All these new creations, one soul at a time, form one new man in Jesus Christ. Christ is at the head of a new humanity, a redeemed human race. And it's because we know this to be true that we are preachers of the Word of God. To state it simply, we believe in the sufficiency of Scripture. It doesn't matter what the problem is. It doesn't matter what controversy you want to discuss. It doesn't matter what issue we want to organize around and meet around and think about. The Word of God is sufficient to address the issue. Are you convinced of that tonight, church? The Word of God is sufficient. What do you say to a world in chaos? You say the Word of God. So let me make an appeal at the outset of our weekend. I say it to myself. I say it to my brethren who will be preaching. I say it to all of you. Can, can we be convinced that we don't need any more cultural commentators. We have enough. We don't need virtue posturing or virtue signaling. Let me let everybody know how culturally sensitive I am so they'll all think better of me. We don't need a Christian version of the world's song. Will someone just please tell us what Scripture says? Is there a place in this world where I can find the truth? The truth. Do you know that's what the church represents in this world? The one place on the planet where you find the truth? 1 Timothy 3.15 says, If I delay, Paul writing to Timothy, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, the family of God which is what? The church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. This is where the truth is upheld. This is where the truth is put on display. That's what this conference is all about. That's why these men have come together. This is what we're asking them to do. Preach the Word. Preach the Word. But how is the Word to be preached? How is the Word of God to be spoken into the chaos that we meet with in this world? The text that we've just read, verses 1 through 6 here in the fourth chapter of 2 Corinthians, it addresses that issue. We, we meet with Paul, who is meeting with chaos. He's meeting with the, with the chaos that sin produces. It's a different kind of chaos than we're discussing this weekend, but it's still the chaos that sin produces. He's facing attacks from false teachers that have influenced the Corinthian church. So he's facing attacks from unbelievers, but he's also now, as a result, facing attacks from immature believers who've been influenced by the false teachers. So they have, they have poisoned the water, and Paul's having to deal with that. He's been forced to defend himself. He finds no pleasure in this. This is nothing that he wants to do. But he has to do it for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the church. And in the third chapter, he begins to to lay out some some characteristics of a God-approved workman, someone who who is sufficient by God's grace to shepherd the people of God. And at the end of that section, he he talks about the man's message. A truly approved servant of God is known by not just his character and not just his manner. He is known by his message. He is known by what he preaches. And Paul 
glories in the fact that he preaches the glorious truths of the new covenant. That's the God approved workman, a preacher of the new covenant, which is to say, he preaches the gospel of grace. He declares the glory of Christ. This is how he commends himself. This is his proven worth. He preaches the gospel. And he will not be ashamed. Preaching the truth brings its own kind of conflict. Paul is in the midst of that kind of conflict, but he will not be dissuaded. He will preach the Word of God, and not only will he preach the Word of God, he will preach the Word of God in the way that it ought to be preached. And so he tells us here in these verses what that looks like. And with the rest of my time this evening, I want to point out five things from our verses that tell us how the Word of God should be declared in a world like ours. Here's the first thing I want to point out, verse 1. God's Word is to be preached with constancy. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, he says, we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart. Lose heart. Ekakeo is the word. Two possible meanings. It could mean to be discouraged, to lose enthusiasm. You're engaged in something that, that you should be enthusiastic about, but here's the danger. You have lost your enthusiasm in the midst of it. You have become discouraged. The other possible meaning is to be afraid. Both of those things come into the picture when you talk about faithful preaching. It's possible that in the midst of preaching and, the, and meeting with the resistance that you meet with when you preach the truth, it's possible to become discouraged by that. I mean, who likes rejection? Who likes conflict? And so then out of fear of meeting with that kind of rejection, meeting with that kind of conflict, what, what are men tempted to do? They are tempted to tame down the message of God's Word. Paul says, I won't do that. We don't do that. We do not lose heart. Our preaching must be faithful in a way that's enduring, in a way that's consistent, in a way that's unchanging. Paul will not tame down the message. He will preach the gospel of grace without being dissuaded because he has experienced this message. Having this ministry, he says, the ministry of the new covenant, by the mercy of God. Paul has known mercy in his own life, God's mercy. He has known God's mercy in his own conversion. He has known God's mercy in his calling. And this is a man who persecuted the church, who was formerly a blasphemer. Now the Lord has not only saved him, he's given him the unimaginable privilege to declare that gospel of grace, to declare his Savior. He is a living exhibit of what he preaches. And so how can he, knowing God's mercy as he does, how can he play the coward? He does not shrink back from the truth of the gospel. He will not allow what is wicked, what is evil, what is bad to move him away from the declaration of God's word. Neither can we. In the face of wicked hostilities on display in our world in so many different ways, when sensitivities run so high... And it feels dangerous to simply say what God has said in His Word. We, we've got to be convinced we can't do better than that. We can't be faithful to God. We can't do better than to simply, faithfully, courageously give the answers that Scripture gives. Preach the Word of God with constancy, with courage. Second thing we see, verse 2, God's Word is to be preached honestly honestly. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's Word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And this is what characterizes faithful gospel ministry, transparency, purity, sincerity, and Paul makes clear that involves a putting off 
And that involves a putting forward. He tells us what he was not going to be characterized by and what he must be characterized by. And he has, he has made a personal decision about this. It's a decisive thing in his mind. He says in verse 2, we refuse. The word means to disown, to renounce. Th these are things I refuse, I renounce. Things he has to put away. What things? Well, first of all, the hidden things of shame. ESV reads to practice, uh, we've renounced rather disgraceful, underhanded ways. Ta krupta teis iskunes is how it reads in the Greek text, kryptos, a hidden thing, iskune, what one conceals from a feeling of shame. So the hidden things of shame. When he talks about those disgraceful ways, three different ways you could understand it. In an objective sense, we, we are not going to um, be involved with that which is hidden because of shame in a subjective sense, of which people are ashamed, in a descriptive sense, shameful things. Which does it mean exactly? We're not, I don't know that we can be that precise. Here's what I can tell you is Paul's not going to live in that neighborhood. He's not going to be involved with anything that we would have to hide because we're ashamed of it. Not going to be what he's involved in. Second, he mentions craftiness. This is what he's going to put away, craftiness to practice cunning. Interesting word. It means all around readiness or a readiness to do anything. It's used five times in the New Testament. It is never used in the positive sense. And in the negative sense, it means capable of anything. So it came to mean trickery, craftiness, to be cunning. Someone has referred to it in this way, the art of misrepresentation. This is what characterized Satan. 2 Corinthians 11.3, but I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. N not some secret life of sin, not engaged in things he has to be ashamed of, not trying to be a salesman so that you've learned the art of winning people over in a way that's not honest and pure and sincere not crafty, not cunning, not going to be characterized by distortion or corrupting of the Word of God. He says he won't tamper with God's Word to falsify, to adulterate. That word translated tamper, sometimes it's used of corrupting gold or wine with inferior ingredients, adding something that corrupts the message. Paul says he will not do this. So, Viewed from the standpoint of the preacher, free from shame, from the standpoint of the presentation, free from craftiness, from the standpoint of the message you present, pure, not calculated to snare by adding our own ingredients. See, that's the honesty of preaching. But honesty in preaching is not just avoiding those things, it's also a positive commitment to something more. He says in verse 2, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. What will, what will he be characterized by in the positive sense? The unleashing of truth. By the open statement of the truth. By the manifestation of the truth. Openness, clearness. The root of that word has in it the thought of a light or a lamp. False teachers are engaged in secret lives of shame. Paul turns the light on. And how does he turn the light on? He turns the light on by declaring the Word of God. I said to the church a couple of weeks ago, and I, and I say it to the young guys in the seminary stop trying to be profound. Be clear. Be clear. And recognize what is profound in preaching. What is profound is not your thinking about the Bible. 
What is profound are not our personal opinions formed from our reading of the Bible. What is profound is the Bible. Preach the Word. And notice that as you do this, what are you appealing to? You're appealing to the consciences of men. By the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience. That's where we're aiming. We're not aiming at man's lower natural appetites. We're not trying to persuade people by making them think well of us. We are aiming at the consciences of people with the truth of God's Word. It is by the open statement of truth that we we commend ourselves to their consciences. And by doing that, preachers themselves are set forth as God's messengers. See, in this way they're commended. In this way they're brought together with the people to whom they preach. Because men sense this, don't they? They sense what drives a man. They sense what motivates him. And when God's servants simply and sincerely and consistently set forth His Word, their genuineness is demonstrated. And that has an effect in the consciences of people. Charles Hodge said this, quote, Those ministers who are humble and sincere, who are not wise in their own eyes, but simply declare the truth as God has revealed it, commend themselves to people's consciences. That is, they secure even the testimony of the conscience of wicked people in their favor. And notice that all of this is before the face of God. End of verse 2, in the sight of God, with integrity before God. We can say it this way, he's a reverent preacher. He preaches so as to please God. He preaches recognizing he will have to give an account to God. And so will every person who's listening to him. And so this is why there is honesty in his preaching. Preach the word of God with courage. Preach the word of God with honesty. Third, God's word is to be preached perceptively. Verse 3, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. We're to preach God's word with a biblically informed perspective of what it is we're doing. How do we understand the act of preaching? How do we understand this ministry? Well, one thing we need to perceive is this is, this is a revealing work. Where the Word of God is being preached, God's sovereign work in souls is being revealed. In the third chapter, Paul talks about a veil over the hearts of people, over the minds of people. When Moses is read, they cannot understand, they cannot comprehend. Why? There's a veil there. And recognize as as we preach the Word of God, verse 3, if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled only to those who are perishing. You see, it's not not for lack of clarity, openness, the open manifestation of the truth that men remain in their lost state. It's because in their natural state, they're blind. They can't see. And so as we preach the Word of God, we, we need to know in advance, everybody's not going to be able to see it. We don't preach the Bible with the false expectation that it's going to be received by all, that it's going to be understood by all. But in the case of some, it's going to mean salvation and a whole new life and a whole new perspective. So we realize that we and the message we preach to some, it's a, an aroma of death leading to death. To others, it's an aroma of life leading to life. Simon J. Kistemacher says the term perishing occurs a few times in Paul's epistles. It refers to those people who knowingly reject the gospel of Christ and by their own choice are following the way that leads to eternal death. Perdition is the fate that awaits the man who does not come to repentance, who rejects the love of the truth, who goes on the broad way that leads to destruction. We understand men are responsible in their sinning. 
But where people are brought to faith in Christ and their lives are transformed, all glory be to Jesus Christ, for that's the sovereign work of God. What this means is we're able to simply set forth the Word of God because people's salvation, it's not explained by the speaker or his cleverness or his skills. It's explained by the sovereign working of the Spirit of God in the souls of people as the Word of God goes forth. It takes away all that salesmanship, doesn't it? What is the gospel? But we perceive, not only is this a revealing work as we're preaching, it is a spiritual work. Because notice in verse 4, what's going on in the case of those who are perishing? In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. See, when this is going on, it's not just a man speaking to other people. There's more going on in the room than just that. The Spirit of God is at work in the lives of those people who are being saved, but we have a real spiritual enemy who's at work where the gospel is rejected and opposed. God in His sovereign will has allowed Satan a measure of activity in this universe, in this age, in opposition to Christ, in opposition to the gospel, in opposition to the souls of men. People are already blind due to the fall. Dead, blind, enslaved, unable to please God. This is what the Bible says so clearly. But realize that in addition to that, Satan is at work blinding people. What does that mean? It means he's at work in this, in this domain of darkness pandering to the fallen desires of people, affirming them, confirming them, baiting them, leading them in a way that is going to lead all the way to their damnation in complete accordance with who they are by nature since the fall. Satan is working to blind minds. We can say it like this, the thing that Satan surely opposes is the very thing that Paul was setting out to do. He opposes the clear, unmixed, unashamed declaration of the glory of Jesus Christ. That's what he opposes. To keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Man, if I know what Satan opposes, that's what I want to do. If what he opposes is the clear, unmixed, unashamed declaration of the gospel of Jesus Christ, then let me clearly, without shame, declare the glory of Jesus Christ. Which leads to a fourth thing we see. Verse 5, God's word is to be preached selflessly. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. This is why Satan is working the way that he is, because of the nature of our work. What do we preach? We preach Jesus as Lord. What does that make us? Well, our message makes clear we are just bondservants of Jesus on behalf of the souls of people. Who are we but simple servants of Jesus Christ? We come as stewards of a message. That is, we are, we're to preach in such a way that we make clear the message is not us and the message is not from us. It's not our wisdom. It's not our answers that people need. They need Christ. They need His truth. Christ is true wisdom for men. As I said earlier enough, with the cultural gurus. What we need is Christ. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through, through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. And don't you love this? So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. 
He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. See, we're not the message. Christ is the message. How do you make sure you don't preach yourself? You preach the word. You preach the Bible. Last thought, verse 6. God's word is to be preached hopefully. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. As we stand to preach the Word of God, we understand who explains and what explains the fact that we're able to do this. I trust you haven't forgotten. I hope we never forget. There we were, blind by nature, not having spiritual eyes, not having spiritual ears, a veil over our minds and hearts. In bondage to sin and to Satan, belonging to the domain that the God of this world rules over, which means we were powerless to deliver ourselves, right? We're blind, we're deaf, we're in bondage. What happened? Well, the God who said, let light shine out of darkness. Go all the way back to when God created everything that He created. Let there be light, and there was. And there you were, there I was, in our darkness, in our bondage, in our blindness, and someone preached the gospel. And God said, let there be light. And there was. And now from the pages of God's Word, we were able to see God's glory in the face of His Son. We saw Jesus for who He really is. We saw that the eternal Son of God left heaven and came to earth and took to Himself a sinless human nature and lived a sinless life under the law on this planet and then died on the cross as a substitute for sinners and was raised from the dead bodily, has ascended into heaven, he's coming again, and he is able to save the uttermost anybody who comes to him by faith. That message was preached, and God opened our hearts just like he did for Lydia so that we paid attention to the things we were hearing. And God granted us by the work of new birth, because of regeneration, we were granted repentance and faith in Jesus. And though we've never seen him with our physical eyes, we loved him. And we turned from our sins and we trusted in him for life. That's how we came to Jesus. And do you realize that is the hope of the world? That's the hope for sinners? So though we're aware that they're held in the clutches of Satan and he's working to blind their minds, we preach the gospel knowing that as it goes forth, God says in the case of the elect, let there be light. And he gathers out from this world those whom he has chosen for salvation and he saves them. It is a sovereign work. It is a creative work. God calls into being what was not there before. It is an effectual work. He secures that which he seeks and it's a transferring work. He takes these people out of one domain and he puts them into the kingdom of his dear son. The Puritan George Swinnock said this, in regeneration nature is not ruined but rectified. The convert is the same man but new made. The faculties of his soul are not destroyed but they are refined. The same violin but newly tuned. Christ gave not the blind man new eyes, but a new sight to the old ones. Christ did not give Lazarus a new body, but enlivened his old body. So God in conversion does not bestow a new understanding, but a new light to the old. Not a new soul, but a new life to the old one. He really makes us new. 
He has delivered us, Colossians 1.13, from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So we're not dealing with a superficial problem. We're here in a world of chaos, and the reason why it's so chaotic is because of sin and because of death and because of darkness. And it's of a nature that we can't fix it. So do we realize from the outset that what this world most desperately needs is for the church to be the church? And what is the church? It's the pillar and support of the truth. Is there a place in this world where I can find the truth? And so we need for the Word of God to be preached clearly. We need to hear. We need to apply the gospel truths of Jesus Christ to this situation. See, it's not just orthodoxy, it's orthopraxy. We've got to take the truth of the gospel and apply it to this situation. And that's what these men will be doing this weekend. And so you pray for them as they come and preach to us. Because what will be sounding forth from this place is an answer that the world won't hear from any other source but the church. And that gives us joy, doesn't it? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you. Thank you for your precious word. Thank you for our Savior, your precious Son. May you bless this weekend. May you bless your word to our hearts and change our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.